Before we proceed with today's panel, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Professor Zhou Mingguan, who is also the organizer of this forum. Please welcome Professor Guan to the stage. And on this panel, we are honored to have Mr. George Yeo. Mr. George Yeo, please welcome to the stage. Mr. Yeo is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Singapore, and he is now a visiting scholar at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And next, we welcome our panelist, Mr. David Lin, to the stage. Mr. David Lin, Lin Yong Le Bu Zhang, is our former Minister of Foreign Affairs, who now serves as Chairman of the Association of Foreign Relations. And finally, let's welcome Professor Philip Xu. Professor Xu teaches political science and serves as the director of the Center for China Studies at National Taiwan University. Please be seated, and now the floor is yours, Professor Guan. In the beginning of this session, first, of course, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Mr. George Yeo, our cousin from over the sea. And um, thank George for sharing his uh, experience and the connections with Taiwan, and also his insights on the complex cross-trade relations with us and uh, between us and the mainland China. <coughs> George talked about different things, but I think there's one thing important that uh, the message that George wants to convey in his speech is that uh, uh, he encouraged Taiwan to plan our future uh, realistically instead of uh, uh, relying on some utterly simplified beliefs. And uh, I don't know, our audience may or may not agree George's points completely. But I think none of us can deny George speak in a very different way. He did not speak as a cold third party. He actually speak from his bottom of his heart, as far as I can tell. And his speech is filled with warmth, affection for Taiwan. This is something different from lots of different speech that I heard in the past years. So I must thank George again for this wonderful and inspiring speech. And to now, I think we can start our discussion. Currently, numerous studies and the poll data show that most Taiwanese support the status quo. And of course, George, in his speech, uh, explained uh, how difficult this, how, how the status quo can be interpreted and how the status quo could be maintained or not. But uh, George seems to suggest that uh, the current situation, the status quo, is unstable and uh, transient. We all know that uh, after the nationalist government moved to Taiwan in 1949, and uh, there are already lots of uh, military conflicts between us and the mainland China in the beginning years. And um, during that time, I believe lots of people, including foreign observers, they will believe that that period of time is transient and unstable. But it has been almost 65 years since the second Taiwan Strait crisis uh, in 1958. And also, it has been almost 45 years since the PRC stopped regularly artillery gunfighting, shooting those uh, artillery rounds on, on two kingmen in, in 1979. So after long periods of time, without any further uh, provocation, why can we think about such a long period of time? It's kind of already stable to some to some sense, 
do we still consider these long periods of time transient and uh, unstable, George? The period of peace bought uh, Taiwan time to reform its own society, to educate its population, mm -hmm. and to grow, and to become a global player. So you need peace to do all that. Um, the status quo is not a time to relax and do nothing, because the clock is ticking. The status quo buys time to do things that need to be done in order to create hope for the future. If this time is wasted, it can lead to tragedy. So I'm always concerned when uh, politicians talk about the status quo as if the status quo is a stable state. It is not a stable state. It is a transient, but it's a valuable transient to do things. Suppose there's uh, no foreign intervention. For example, we, we, we all know the cross-strait relation become worse, especially in the last few years, partly because of the US and the mainland China uh, contest. Uh, without such uh, confrontation, would this uh, uh, pass of five, six or five or six decades be considered is already a state that gradually converging to a steady state? The U.S. is increasingly threatened by a rising China. Uh, China does not threaten the U.S. Uh, militarily, but China threatens U.S. dominance in the world. And because of this, U.S. strategic preoccupation now is with trying to slow China down, contain China, pull down China if possible. So all of us are familiar with the chip war which is going on. And the systematic effort uh, done by whole departments in Washington to find ways to slow down China, to degrade China if possible. Of course, whether they succeed or not depends on how China responds. So Taiwan is caught in this larger struggle. So the question for Taiwan is this. You cannot affect US-China relations, but you can decide how much you want to be used by America against China. If you decide that you, you want to be used by America against China in the hope that one day there is a chance the door opens and I rush out and become independent, then understand that there is a big risk involved. But I think it is better for ordinary people who only want peaceful lives for themselves and their children to say, look, don't drag me in. This is your fight. This is your fight. So you notice that how much Taiwan green leaders may want to, to push. They are limited by what the US allows them to do. So the US will not allow Taiwan to affect their game. But if you allow yourself to be used by the U.S., you will be used by the U.S. when it's convenient for the U.S. And if it's no longer convenient for the U.S., Taiwan will be sacrificed, which was what happened in 72. So I think if I were Taiwanese, I say, no, no, no. I need the U.S. because it improves my relationship, my negotiating position with China, but do not become a plaything of the U.S. Then all of us, our lives are at risk. May I add a point? So, George, I agree with you that the status quo uh, may not be permanent, may not be forever. But at the same time, we have to define so what the status quo means uh, for Taiwan. Uh, actually, uh, to me, the status quo means peace and stability, and also cooperation and development. Because uh, over the past 74 years, since 1949, we have tried everything to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, in fact, uh, because of we maintain peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and also in the region, so all countries, including uh, mainland China, 
including ASEAN countries, including Japan and South Korea, can enjoy such sustainable growth and economic development. So this is really unprecedented and, and sustainable. So we want to make sure that peace and stability uh, can continue. At the same time, I also agree with you that the United States uh, actually doesn't want to see Taiwan's unification uh, with China. At the same time, China doesn't want to see Taiwan's independence. So there's a dilemma we have to face. At the same time, we have to take into account how we can maintain peace and stability. So for the moment, uh, we, uh, it seems to me that we have only one option. The option uh, is peace. The option is also how to maintain the status quo. The, and maintaining the status quo for as long as possible is also uh, in the best interest of all parties concerned. It's also consistent uh, with US interest for the region. Uh, and also given the context of uh, US-China strategic competition or great power competition uh, in the region, so Taiwan uh, certainly can uh, take that into account and see how we can cope with the situation and we can try to maintain peace and stability while in cooperation, in partnership uh, with the United States, uh, with Japan and other like-minded countries. So I think this is the still the top priority for Taiwan for the moment. Okay, thank you. F uh, Philip, can, can you also say something about this, especially about the, the period of time? Uh, if this is just uh, considered transient, then the, what, what can we really do during the, this time period? The, the George just mentioned that at such a time, the opportunity is precious. So how, how can we utilize this uh, uh, period of time to do something uh, to move forward? Let me respond to uh, Professor Kwan's first questions together with uh, uh, Mr. Yeo's um, uh, responses to that. Um, I agree that the U.S.-China hegemonic competition is one of the most important factors leading to cross-strait instability as well as the uh, uh, you know, uh, fluctuations in the trilateral relations between the U.S., Taiwan, and China. Um, so in that sense, the current uh, sort of situation or peace is probably to some extent fragile and transient um, a little bit, right? On the other hand, I guess we have to pay attention to the fact that uh, it is also related, closely related, to Beijing's anxiety about Taiwan public opinions increasing, drifting away from the prospect of unification. For example, um, there has been a long-standing public opinion survey in Taiwan examining Taiwan people's national identity pattern. In that question, over the past two decades or so, uh, three, uh, there's only one question and three options provided in the questions. The first is whether you identify yourself as a Taiwanese only. The second is that whether you identify yourself as a Chinese only. And the third one is whether you identify yourself both as a Taiwanese and a Chinese. Well, when this uh, public opinion survey began about three decades ago, the relative majority, not absolute, but the relative majority was the uh, dual identity, the third option, okay? Which I guess consisted with the uh, uh, the mainstream public opinion in Taiwan preferring the maintenance of status quo. However, about 15 years ago, this began to change. The uh, preference for uh, exclusive Taiwanese identity, which is the first option I just mentioned, began to override the respondents uh, favoring the third, uh, the third option. And this sort of changing reality, I guess, is uh, transparent. It's a transparent information for Beijing. And I guess that adds tremendously to Beijing's, Beijing's anxiety that Taiwan seems to be drifting increasingly away from the prospect of unification or the formula of unification set by Beijing. So I, I think that was a very important factor. And that began to emerge long before the uh, hegemonic competition between the US and China. That began roughly uh, around the year 2017. So that's something I want to add. Thank you. It seems that uh, given such information, does it give um, mainland China some urgent feeling that they need to do something uh, in a short time course? Well, I agree with uh, Minister Yeo's comment when he was made the uh, keynote speech that uh, 
probably the first priority for Beijing would still be to uh, solve prostrate disputes or to unify Taiwan through peaceful rather than military means, however, right? However, uh, as we know that the uh, predominant view or predominant preference of mainstream public opinion in Taiwan has been favoring the maintenance of status quo compared to the other two options, independence or unification. So I think that's also something that has put important constraint on any ruler or political party in Taiwan. And I think that's also a transparent information for Beijing as well. So in that sense, I think Beijing has also not given up the possible sort of second priority option by unify Taiwan through uh, military means. So that's why we've seen the uh, mounting coercive pressures uh, from Beijing, especially in the, um, in the realm of military security upon Taiwan. Um, so I guess that Beijing has a sort of a sense of chronic crisis or urgency uh, you know, for it to, make, to, to launch such pressures on Taiwan. We just mentioned that most Taiwanese do support the status quo and do not want to see the current situation be changed. And it strikes me that uh, any move that breaks the status quo would create uh, more instability and unpredictability of the future. So given the current Taiwanese mentality and uh, this unpredictability, so why should Taiwan initiate a move toward a merger, as you suggested, uh, George? I always remember what Lee Kuan Yew told us when I was in this cabinet. He said, never govern by polling. Never govern by polling. Because if you are governing by polling, you are not leading. You are being led. And if a society is being led by polls, you will lead to tragedy. And very often, when you are striking new directions, the leader is in the minority. So I, I, I'm familiar with all these polls, and I'm sure the mainland is concerned, but the key is leadership, not polls. And leadership must seek further than the people being polled. That's why you're a leader. You must look ahead, see the trends, where the dangers are, and say, no, we cannot go that way. You may always think that that way is easier, but you will lead to disaster. No, we take the difficult route, because after that, it will be a bright future. So this is my response to the idea of polling. The time that we have during the status quo must be time that we use to build trust. Find common areas. If I do not want to be your friend, I will find reasons why we should not meet, why we should be angry with each other. And every little fault is magnified. But if I want to be your friend, and you want to be my friend, we will find common areas. And concentrate on common areas. And say the difficult things, let's put aside. Find common areas. And after a while, trust grows. And as the circle of trust grows, the overlap increases, and all kinds of possibilities, not possible in the past, will emerge. And it's a bit troubling the way education is being pursued because education influences young minds. I watched in Hong Kong what happened. I'm not saying that the situation is the same here. I was told by a young student who sought me out as a mentor when I was working there. He was only 16 years old. He said, you know, 80% of my teachers are anti-China. And so they became anti-China. And to be a student leader, you had to be anti-China. And it led to a mass illusion that they can be independent. And when you build your hopes on an illusion, it leads to tragedy. So leaders have to say, no, this will lead to tragedy. Look ahead. So trust is important, and it's important not to, in the younger generation, create more distrust. Because if there's more distrust, then the area of overlap reduces, and an unhappy outcome in the future is more likely. So the status quo is not a time to do nothing. It's a time to do a lot of things. And there's a certain 
in my view, urgency to it. Uh, of course, given the current Taiwan situation, uh, I'm not very sure that any leader can choose to ignore the poor or those surveys. And uh, I think there's one thing different between Taiwan and Singapore, that uh, because you, you, I agree with you that uh, the reason why we need a leader because we need the leader's uh, vision and also his, his courage to take a sometimes bold action and to do something. But given the Taiwan situation, we, we don't just have one leader, not like in Singapore, we, you, you have Li Guang Yao. But in Taiwan, uh, in early time, President Li Denghui has his views on Taiwan's future. That's what he chose, something that he did. And uh, later on, um, President Ma Ying-jeou has uh, uh, his view, and uh, he, he was brave enough to, to push lots of things. And the current president, Tsai Ing-wen, she also ha has her own views. So uh, how can we say one leader's view is better, will lead Taiwan to a better future rather than another one's uh, view? So we, we don't just have a single view on this. Uh, so George, I, I agree with you that uh, both leadership uh, and understanding polls are important. And leadership may be more important but in Taiwan's case, of course, uh, we have uh, regular elections, presidential elections, parliamentary elections. So for all leaders, they have to consider uh, the support approval rating uh, from the general public. So when the majority of our people in Taiwan support the status quo, then of course that is one element we have to take into account. On the other hand, I also like to point out that maintaining status quo is not only a strategy, actually that's the uh, direction for the future. Uh, at the same time, of course, we need to uh, strengthen our values. You mentioned earlier that Taiwan is a valuable asset, not only uh, for uh, ourselves, but also for the United States, uh, for mainland China, for the entire world. So Taiwan needs to further develop and strengthen uh, Taiwan's values, Taiwan's strength, economically and strategically, uh, including TSMC, uh, I mentioned this the other day. Uh, Taiwan ha already has the largest semiconductor industry in the world. That is also a strength uh, for Taiwan's values. And then Taiwan, of course, is very strategically located. Uh, we, uh, we are uh, in the center of the first island chain so we can really provide all the opportunities to facilitate a trade, a sea transportation, air transportation for the region. Taiwan is an important linkage between Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. So we need to expand uh, all these activities. We need to make other countries understand uh, Taiwan's values, Taiwan's strength. Uh, that is also the guarantee uh, for Taiwan to maintain the path of peace and stability, uh, and also uh, in our way uh, to cope with mainland China. <laughs> President Ma's uh, question is beyond our uh, imagination. So. <laughs> My question is directed to uh, Minister Yu. You mentioned the idea of Chinese uh, uh, representation. Is that? Commonwealth. Oh, Commonwealth. Chinese Commonwealth. Yeah, this is a fascinating idea. When I met with uh, Xi Jinping eight years ago in Singapore, I didn't mention that. Have you ever mentioned anything like this to any official from the PRC? Have you ever? Uh, I've mentioned it, I've touched on it. And someone asked me, because I have a prepared script for my speech today, someone asked me if I had shown it to the PRC ambassador. I said, how can I do that? <laughs> is, that is that their only reaction? 
My own guess is, no, that, that, that there's been no reaction. There's been no reaction. My own guess is they will, they will pause and think about it. But I remember in the 90s, I read an article by a senior PLA officer who mm. talked about the possibility of the PLC changing its name if there is a merger with Taiwan, that it has to be a transcending of both entities. So I believe that in the internal thinking, these possibilities are something they would consider. And if Taiwan were to raise it with them, I think you can have a conversation. Do you have a chance to explain to them what Chinese Commonwealth is? Sorry, I have to interrupt. <laughs> we will come back to this issue. <laughs> Otherwise, I, will, I have to ask you to become the moderator. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't we, matter. We will come back to this question too. Yeah. No, no I'm just very curious. I think that's an interesting idea. President Ma, what I'm, I say today, I will be, I'm prepared to say on the mainland. Yes, we will talk about this. Yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, since President Ma already raised this question, actually, that was a uh, question I'm, I was about to ask. Uh, the, yes, uh, uh, in, in George's speech, he did mention that a, common, a Chinese Commonwealth may be a potential resolution. Of course, he didn't say that's the resolution. Um, so first, I would like to ask George to say a little bit more on this Chinese Commonwealth, to be more sp specific, because you, you did give some example, like based on Iceland, primitive example. And can you say, Probably you already have some idea about what the Chinese Commonwealth might be, uh, what kind of mechanism, and, and, uh, whatever we call this Bang Lian or Guo Xie. So, George, would you please say a little bit more on this? Well, the idea is do we see a common future? If we see a common future, then we'll find a way, step by step, even though there may have to be detours to get there then however close we are, in the end our paths will diverge. And when people talk, and they're very bright people on both sides of the street, when they start thinking, when they look back at history, when they have the inspiration from other countries and from other civilizations, they say, no, we can do this first, we can do that first. You compare mainland Taiwan relations today with what it was in 1980, 1990, 2000. You're already much closer than before. What you now have would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. So 20 years from now, make it closer still. Don't move back, move forward. And I'm sure that when people sit down to talk, many ideas will come up, some will be discarded, others will be considered, some will be practical. And the important thing is, Benefit people, you know, fishermen, farmers, small businessmen, industrialists, tourists, students, scientists, researchers. If there's benefit, then people will get together. People will learn more, find out more. So for myself, my father was born in Singapore. His father was from China. My mother's from China. I tell my friends, learn more about China because it's going to become very big. If China's per capita GDP reaches half that of the US, it's a quarter now, then China's GDP will be equal to that of the US and EU combined. US and EU combined. Their domestic market is already as significant as the US. So whatever you do, whether as a scientist or as an employee or as a businessman, you cannot ignore China. And the more you study China, the more you say, yeah, I'm part of it. it. To some extent, even as a Singaporean, I feel I'm a part of it. Because that's my ancestry. And you will feel a part of it. But if you say, no, I don't want to know China, you demonize China, and you put that into young people's minds, eventually they will find out. But only after painful lessons. So Lee Kuan Yew was once asked, what if despite everything, the Taiwanese insist on going this way? His reply was, well, it's a question of the price they have to pay before they learn the lesson. So 
The reason why we have this conversation is to reduce the price the ordinary Taiwanese will have to pay. You look at Ukraine. It is an unbelievable tragedy to go back to where they were in February 23rd last year. Would have been, it's the maximum position they can achieve now after having lost hundreds of thousands of lives. For what? What have they gained? They could have avoided this position. The Taiwan ambassador, the Ukraine ambassador in Singapore, a dear friend, Pavlo Sotansky, when the invasion happened, he wrote me an email how he avoided machine gun fire and tanks to make his way to Poland, where he had a son or a daughter working and became the representative of the Ukrainian foreign ministry in Ukraine. When he was in Singapore, we had long conversations. He said, no, Russia will implode. Putin cannot remain. I said, but what if he does? So if you build all your hopes on the possibility that the other side will collapse, you will cut options off. And then in the end, you are trapped in a position which is very disadvantageous. So Taiwan now should open, open the possibilities for the future, not constrict it. And it's important that in the education of the young, your media, everyone has responsibility. But if in the end, people refuse, then we go back to what Li Kuan Yew said. Then it's a matter of the price you have to pay before you turn back. Of course, uh, I know in, in current Taiwan that uh, lots of people are thinking in a different way. And uh, so that's a reason why we want to bring in different opinions. I have to say now, fewer and fewer people are we willing to say what you just said. And uh, so we are happy that we have this opportunity to bring your opinion to our general public. And uh, I hope this idea can be spread. Uh, yeah, thank thank you. Yeah, thank you, George. I agree with you that see, we uh, demonizing uh, China is not a good idea. Uh, we uh, we have to uh, cope with China uh, in, as it rises as the, as a superpower in the world. But actually, as you know, uh, China has been Taiwan's uh, you see the largest trading partner already for quite some time. So we have maintained a close economic uh, cooperation and interaction. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, so at the same time, of course, we need to strengthen uh, our dialogue and communication uh, with the PRC uh, you see, uh, for, the, for the future. I think that is the priority. But whether we can really get to the stage how to proceed uh, with the, the so-called Chinese and the Commonwealth, I think um, maybe um, this is still a little bit far-fetched. Uh, actually, I'm also curious about the, the concept of Chinese uh, Commonwealth. Uh, as you know, the British Commonwealth and now called Commonwealth, it's a very loose association. So if you mean the Chinese Commonwealth uh, is the relationship, for instance, between Singapore uh, and the UK or Singapore uh, with China, then probably that will be a more appealing, more attractive uh, to, to the people in Taiwan. Uh, but again, you see, it's very difficult to define so what the, uh, the Chinese Commonwealth really uh, will look like, whether that will be attractive, whether that will be supported, whether that will be accepted by the people in Taiwan. So I think this is still a question uh, we need to, uh, to try uh, to find some uh, interpretations or some explanation. So how, how do you respond to this? Let, let, let me put, this, put it in this way. That's uh, uh, a close economic connection between Taiwan and mainland China have been years. And of course that gives us some foundation to move towards uh, a Chinese Commonwealth or something similar. So of course then I, I need a more a clearer description of about the, the Chinese Commonwealth, what it might be, how it looks like. And, uh, but I have to say, 
even such a proposition is not purely economical because the political decision is the most important thing. So other than explaining what the Chinese Commonwealth might be, I will also ask uh, uh, you to, uh, to, to think about this. George says that uh, the mainland China should not object this idea. And, uh, but to my knowledge, I think this idea has been proposed before in different occasions. But to my knowledge, uh, the mainland China government never, has never given any, they actually ignored this proposition, uh, let alone given any positive response to it. So could this Chinese Commonwealth be a wishful thinking by us or by only a few people? I would like to hear some from uh, Philip. Can you say, how do you think about what's the ideal form that it may be? And also, uh, mainland China's attitude towards this. I, think I pretty much agree with uh, Professor Guan's uh, observation that in the past, though this idea has been proposed either through academic discussions or through some sort of uh, second track diplomacy, we have never heard any positive response from almost anybody of mainland China. I guess at least there are a number of uh, practical obstacles to be overcome if we really want to enter into a stage of serious discussion about this uh, by governments from both sides. The first is really the wide disparity in terms of uh, you know, comprehensive national power, economic size, so on and so forth, between Taiwan and China. And so that's really something uh, drastically different from what we've seen in many successful uh, models of uh, supranational integration, such as EU. So that's the first obstacle. The second is that, um, um, uh, as far as we know, Beijing's official canon about unification has been always focusing on a unitary state, rather than anything uh, that would accommodate a formula like confederation or commonwealth. And this is related to the third obstacle. The third obstacle is that, um, you know, taking EU as an example, the, uh, such an integration model uh, entails or permits the national representation in governmental international organization, which I think is pretty hard for Beijing to accept if Taiwan enjoys, for example, full membership in the UN. Uh, you know, that's a sort of, that takes a very strong political will on the part of Beijing. And I suspect even any leader, even though like a strong man like Xi Jinping, would be willing to do that, uh, you know, given the fact that China is facing currently mounting domestic challenges as well as external problems, okay? Um, the final one, I guess, is really about the sustainability of a model like Commonwealth or Confederation. Again, taking EU as an example, it's one of the most common or the most, mentioned, the most frequently mentioned problem of EU is the problem of so-called democratic deficits. That means that you know, throughout the process of uh, long-term integration, there has been a problem of various EU countries not paying sufficient attention to the need and demand or aspiration of grassroots citizens in their domestic context. Okay? So again, public opinion, for example, in Taiwan, is still very important, not only to initiate, but also to sustain such a um, supranational uh, model of integration, such as Commonwealth or Confederation. So that's some of my observations. Let me speak as a diplomat. Uh, when Gu Zhenfu, when he said, one China consensus, each side has its own interpretation. So he was very close to the period when the 92 consensus was set. And on that basis, he met Wang Dao Han. China has said, on, the, on this basis of one China consensus, Sima Do Kei Tan. Sima Do Kei Tan. Sima Do Kei Tan includes the Commonwealth. So, you do not want to define too clearly what you want to do. But you can say, look, this is the 92 consensus. We at that time said to each his own interpretation. So I give my interpretation. You say anything can be discussed, so it includes this which I'm now putting on the table. Now, they can say, I don't want to discuss it. Eh? You say anything can be discussed. Now you don't want to discuss it. 
You have gone back on your word. So diplomatically, this is how I will make my initial moves. Don't say too much, but say put it on the table first. And let it evolve because they will begin to signal back what is possible, what is not possible. You will signal. Then you will get to know each other. So earlier, Vice President Vincent Xu talked about his first meeting with Li Lanqing in 1992, where I was honoured to be present. And it out of it grew a personal friendship which lasted a lifetime. So when people start talking and exploring, all kinds of personal friendships will grow. Li Lanqing told me in 2003, he launched the official history of the Qing Dynasty. The official history of the Qing Dynasty has not yet been written. There was one produced by Ming Kuo, but it was not a good job. And he told the scholars, don't rush to a decision. And from 99 volumes, it became 250 volumes. I do not know when they'll complete it, because there's so much material in the Qing Dynasty, including material about the Christian missions that went to China including material about Taiwan. All that history will have to be written. Now, the moment we start talking about all these things, we'll say, oh yeah, yeah, we were, did this together. We fought the Japanese together. We helped each other. There was an earthquake in Nanao Island. The people came to, 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 to southern Taiwan, and so on. Then slowly, slowly, trust will build up. Take our time but begin by holding the PRC to its word. Anything can be discussed, so I want to discuss this. I said at the time, it's my interpretation, I interpret it this way, let's begin from here, and slowly, slowly build up trust. We will not become like the EU. I think the initial process will be more like ASEAN. ASEAN, every country is sovereign. All over the world, we fly our national flag, we fly the ASEAN flag together. We promise that in any other country, if you need help and you don't have an embassy, any ASEAN embassy will help you. And more and more at international meetings at the UN, ASEAN countries come together. We're getting closer and closer together. We have become ASEAN citizens. Now, I do not know between Taiwan and the mainland what will evolve, but we're not talking about the European model. ASEAN has no executive. It has a small secretariat. But the leaders meet very often. If you have one China consensus and you have, say, two meetings every year between the leaders of China and Taiwan, the way Ma Ying, President Ma Ying-Chu met President Xi Jinping, say two meetings a year, and we discuss these things. And officials have to prepare papers and so on. That would be a huge advance. Is that possible? I think it's entirely possible. M Mr. Lin, as an, uh, also as a diplomat, how do you think that uh, uh, this is uh, possible? I mean, if we really put it, uh, want to start some negotiation, it's truly that uh, everything can be discussed. Even though Wang Daohan says on the one China uh, principle that everything can be discussed, but is this still possible in President Xi's period? Uh, George, certainly it's a very nice way of putting this. But actually, uh, one China policy or one China principle uh, is something uh, very difficult, uh, especially um, under the interpretation of strategic ambiguity. Now, we know that you have tried to uh, make this work. So under one China principle, everything can be discussed Everything is possible. But in fact, whether we can really make some arrangement, uh, that will be uh, extremely difficult. How to get the process moving uh, to the future about the uh, Chinese, the concept of Chinese Commonwealth. Uh, you mentioned ASEAN. ASEAN can be a good example, but whether the ASEAN example can be applicable uh, is the, um, in the so-called one China context. So this is uh, very uh, extremely difficult, I think, for the people in Taiwan. Uh, on the other hand, we have to realize that in Taiwan, uh, there's no consensus. Uh, there's no national consensus regarding this issue. Uh, 
uh, for the DPP, uh, for the KMT, and for other parties. So we have different ideas about how to proceed uh, see, uh, with, uh, in our relation with the PRC. So the Chinese Commonwealth concept certainly will need a lot of time uh, to be uh, dealt with, to be discussed, or to reach some kind of consensus. Actually, the, I can just follow up this question because uh, uh, a Chinese Commonwealth, this proposition is kind of like a one step forward from the 1992 consensus. And on one hand, um, any such uh, Commonwealth uh, will require certain governing mechanism. Uh, it cannot just be so primitive like the example in Iceland. So they need some uh, formal institution to resolve various economic and political issues. And so it should not be surprising to reach an agreement on such a mechanism, such a governing mechanism, would be even more difficult to reach the 1992 consensus. On the other hand, that uh, we all know that our current ruling party, DPP, and the many Taiwanese people, they do not even accept the legitimacy of the 1992 consensus. So, so it's just hard for me to imagine that uh, how Taiwanese can jump into even a more difficult Chinese Commonwealth, uh, the discussion of this Chinese Commonwealth initiative. Can you say a little bit about this, George? I'm very mindful that I should not uh, interfere. Uh, I can only say, if you ask me, that's how I see the future. If, if every way is not possible except this way, then I say good luck, all the best. But I believe in the way, after paying a price, you will come back. And every time I look at Ukraine and lament the horrors that the people went through, only to find themselves back to more or less the, the, the first position which they were at without a war, is such a tragedy. And it, it, of course, I don't live here, so it would not be my tragedy, but it would be very painful to watch. What, what will happen? Uh, I would say that we are really moving into some uh, very uh, difficult and dangerous times. Uh, from 1992 consensus uh, to uh, your proposal of a one China, one Chinese Commonwealth, uh, I think that there will be uh, a lot of things uh, to be clarified. Uh, so maybe there can be some informal, informal um, exchange uh, between Taiwan uh, uh, and Singapore. Uh, we don't know how this can be started, uh, because Singapore is always a very special friend uh, to Taiwan. We are very grateful to Singapore for facilitating, as you mentioned earlier, the Guan Hui Tan and also the Ma Xi Hui, uh, Ma Xi meeting uh, in 2015. So maybe in, in that context, uh, Singapore can really play a very important part to bridge the gap, uh, to uh, serve uh, is as a uh, coordinator, trying to uh, clarify the situation, trying to understand uh, what is possible, or what is not possible, uh, including the idea of a Chinese Commonwealth. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether the PRC, whether mainland China can even agree to sit together to discuss this issue. Maybe through track two or through a third party, uh, maybe something can, can, can be uh, you see, uh, implemented, something we can push forward a little bit, step by step. Uh, but I think for the time being, maintaining the status quo of peace and stability uh, for Taiwan's future development uh, is still the top priority. Uh, and on that, you see, we have much more uh, national consensus. Now, all political parties in Taiwan, the majority of Taiwanese people can support such an idea. So at the same time, we can wait maybe for some future time, uh, we can pursue some other alternatives. 
Let me be very brief. Uh, I want to make two points. The first is that I want to echo Minister Lin's uh, previous point that uh, even though any future leader or leaders in the next few years in Taiwan may not be really able to seriously discuss any model of unification with China under the agreement of the mainstream public opinion in Taiwan, but at least, as uh, Mr. Ling has pointed out, that restoring a dialogue communication is of you know, utmost importance to sort of rebuilding, to rebuild the trust between Taipei and Beijing, or at least to uh, ease up the suspicions or mutual distrust, which is, would easily uh, lead to war and uh, jeopardize uh, stability. That's the first point. The second one is that um, we have to resolve this sort of a chicken egg problem. On the one hand, uh, the mainstream public opinion is increasingly distrustful of Beijing, let alone, talk, let alone talking about unification, because of uh, the uh, mounting coercive pressures upon, from Beijing to uh, coerce Taiwan into unification or negotiation. On the other hand, Beijing is also uh, increasingly um, anxious in feeling that uh, unification is uh, sooner, uh, had better be achieved sooner than rather than later, because uh, they, it feels that the U.S. support for Taiwan seems to be creating the effect of a so-called hollowing out Washington One China policy, which has actually aggravated tremendously since uh, 2016. So we really have to you know, resolve this uh, chicken egg problem before we can seriously talk about any um, future uh, model of integration. That's it. I fully agree. President Ma actually proposed no independence, no unification, no use of force. Actually, that was a very important uh, political foundation uh, during that time. Uh, so we have also uh, dealt with uh, very smoothly uh, with the United States and also with the PRC. So I think that is also part of the status quo we are trying to maintain. So we'll see uh, what we, we can do for the future. At the same time, I also like to point out that uh, the Taiwan issue or the cross trade relationship is not only the relationship uh, between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait, but actually the future development, the further trend will be seriously affected um, by the strategic competition, by the, by the great power relationship uh, between the United States and China. And then, of course, we have to consider the geopolitical reality uh, in a wider context, especially for the region. So I think Taiwan has a role to play uh, in such a process, but we have to cooperate uh, with our partners. George mentioned that uh, the status quo, actually also including um, President Mars, is actually something not sustainable in the longer run. And uh, so, so George, you still want to elaborate on this? Uh, we need to do uh, something for to move things forward. Me, the meeting between uh, President Ma and President Xi in Singapore was a profound development. What did President Ma concede to have that meeting? Putu puu, putong, to a kongsi. And they had a very good meeting. What did Xi Jinping concede? He did something which no other Chinese leader did, which was to recognize the leader of Taiwan as an equal. Each addressed the other as centrum. This was a major move. 2015, Xi Jinping only became Zong Su Chi in October 2022 and president in March 2023. He had just fought off Zhou Yongkang. He was in a, still in a vulnerable position. He had not yet cleaned up the PLA. And he made this move at personal risk to himself. I think he paid a heavier price than President Ma to have that meeting. That meeting was very significant. Is it impossible to have regular summits between the leaders of China and Taiwan, each addressing the other as sanction with dignity, each paying half the bill. And can still meet in Singapore. It's okay. <laughs> Singapore will be honored. This was what the leaders of Iceland and Switzerland did. They just met as equals. 
and talk about common problems and say, okay, we meet again. Maybe initially you meet in Singapore, then after that you can alternate between Beijing and, and Taipei. And after that, some other lovely spots. You see? Little by little, trust will build. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. It's already been done. There's a precedent, there's a template. I'm very glad you mentioned Putong Putu Bu. That was my uh, idea when I was president. And now I retire. But my ideas do not retire. Why? Because the, our candidate, Ho Yo Yi, also want to succeed to that. Putong Putu Bu. See what I mean? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Oh, another thing is the com about the Commonwealth. In the 19th century, 20th century, there is British Commonwealth. Yeah, in the, the last century, you have, we have the uh, Russians Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, but I don't think we should follow their example. And we should develop our own model of development. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, so, but I still want to raise a question that lots of Taiwanese people concerned. And I would like to get you some feedback from, from all three of our panelists is uh, uh, because we've been talking about uh, different things about the Commonwealth but uh, more important question to Taiwanese people is that uh, uh, under this framework uh, how Taiwan could realistically maintain its identity in, its, in this proposed Commonwealth this is I think is uh, of particular concern to lots of Taiwanese people and especially when mainland Chinese is and will still be the dominant economy and the military force, then how can we still have our identity? How, uh, not just identity, but also our, our, our autonomy uh, to, to a large extent. So any one of you want to start first? I think in Taiwan, uh, 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 opinion, opinion polls, polls are still are very important. Very important. National consensus is also important uh, in order to reach any conclusion or any agreement to proceed with new initiatives. So I think this is the reality we have to face uh, in a full-fledged democracy like Taiwan. Uh, so for the future, uh, I think we also need such a process uh, of moving forward uh, See, uh, to the proposal uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned by uh, George. Uh, so there's a long way to go, but we have to consider the top priority. So we are uh, acting, uh, we are doing now, right now. I think that is more important. Uh, so for a Chinese Commonwealth, for other ideas, I think we can still wait. For the moment, we need to maintain peace and stability uh, in order to uh, step up to accelerate um, Taiwan's further development economic strength. I think that's important. Professor Guan asked about maintaining Taiwan identity. Let me take the liberty of interpreting this question as uh, maintaining both identity and autonomy. I guess at least three elements are probably uh, consequential when we just focus on the model of Commonwealth. The first is to maintain Taiwan's um, autonomous uh, force of national defense. The second is to maintain the political slash legal system where um, you know, the government Taipei enjoys the highest authority in terms of uh, determining its internal affairs in uh, legal and uh, political spheres. And the final one is that Taiwan uh, should be granted sufficient or adequate uh, international space as a sovereign nation. Uh, that is consistent with the mainstream public Taiwan opinion, which is of course a, I guess, you know, still um, pose very uh, serious challenges, um, even though just want to create this model of uh, confederation. Yes. About the uh, identity thing that the Taiwanese people worry about in any negotiation, any discussion, that Taiwanese worry about the losing this identity. Joe, ever losing his identity because of the circumstances of the history and the present. It's like uh, an oyster which has something it cannot 
remove, which is stuck with, which is a political situation. But out of it, a pearl forms. So I look at Cixi, I look at TSMC. Without that sand in the side of the pearl, of the oyster, TSMC and Cixi could not have flourished. The key is for the future, you must keep your talent. Because the bright people, they have options. Many Taiwanese have become Singaporeans. Why? They are afraid for the future. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, do they want their children to be in Taiwan? I think that is the single most important question. Do everything so that Taiwanese will remain in Taiwan and continue to grow that pearl. And the status quo by itself cannot achieve that. Thank you very much. Uh, we will still have some time. We will open to the question from the slider. But uh, of course, I would like to say something uh, also about the identity thing that uh, lots of people worry about. Just like George just mentioned, Taiwan actually has its own identity in many different aspects. Uh, in, in George's speech, he repeatedly mentioned about Siji and uh, some other religious groups. What uh, those groups have done is kind of identity. And uh, our semiconductor, our IT industry, is some kind of identity. And uh, we even say Ding Huai Ming, the Yunmen, is also another identity. We do already have lots of identities we, we, we can be proud of. So while lots of people still worry about we are losing our identity in any negotiation process, I think we should be more confident about the identity that we already built in the past years. So now, uh, we, we will check what kind of question we have on the slide. Though. You can scan the QR code on the screen to join the conversation. We have our first question from Thomas Hu. What can Taiwan learn from Singapore in striking a balance when choices of security alliance and political economic partnerships are in conflict? Henry Kissinger uh, describes Singapore in this way. He says the Singaporeans are cold-blooded in the analysis of the global situation. You cannot be subjective. We cannot change the world. We have to accept the world for what it is. We have to adjust to the world. And uh, that's how we have survived. We are constantly re-triangulating our position. I was asked, if we are forced to a choice between the US and China, what will Singapore do? Again, I'm not reflecting Singapore government's position. This is my position. I said, well, if you ask me today, we'll support the US because we are financial center. It's a US-controlled international financial system. Our military is heavily dependent on American weaponry. I was head of Air Force planning. I bought American equipment, American missiles. But if you ask me 20 years from now, which side will we jump if we are forced? I say I'm not so sure because by that time, China would be a very huge economy and very much a part of the lives of all Southeast Asians. So the strategic environment changes all the time. And when you are small, you have to adjust to the environment. We cannot change the environment. We can change a little bit in ASEAN, maybe, but that's all. We have to accept the world for what it is and be very objective, very cold-blooded in how we analyze the situation. This goes back to Ping Fa, Zi Ji Zi Bi. This is very critical. The moment we are subjective, we are in danger. I think certain strategic environments are probably um, suitable for that than in others. And whether or not Taiwan has this strategic environment, I guess uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, questionable. Um, you know, not only because of Taiwan's um, um, confrontation with uh, with China in both the sovereignty over the both the sovereignty and military security issues, but also because Taiwan's internal situation, where the mainstream public opinion is really not so trustful of China, and you know any sort of uh, governmental friendship gestures or policy toward China may sometimes breed uh, you know dire consequences domestically, which is of course not the case in Singapore at all. So. Um, I guess still hedging strategy is something that Taiwan can, can consider, 
but, but for, you know, as uh, Mr. Yeo has pointed out, for any leader who has a really long-term vision or foresight, you know, they have to change the both internal and external strategic environment of Taiwan in order to pursue such a, a wiser and more well-deliberated policy. Thanks. Uh, actually, I have very high admiration uh, for Singapore uh, as a very uh, important uh, country uh, in the region. Uh, Singapore has developed a very uh, highly developed economy, the financial center in the region, uh, now surpassing Hong Kong. Uh, Singapore has also maintained a very important uh, military power, uh, so as a deterrence, uh, as a defense for itself. But more importantly, uh, Singapore is in ASEAN. Uh, so the whole ASEAN, actually, the whole block has become more important. Together, it has already become the fifth largest economy uh, in the world. So we can see that Singapore has been very successful uh, in line with its own foreign policy and also the policy taken by ASEAN as a whole. So Singapore uh, is not taking sides, is not choosing a side between uh, the United States and China. Uh, so I think this is a very wise policy move uh, whether uh, Taiwan can also consider, can learn something from the Singaporean experience uh, given the fact that we are also torn now between uh, the United States um, and the PRC uh, in such uh, strategic competition. Uh, so the great power uh, relationship actually is here to stay. Uh, so I think that is why uh, Kisho Mabobani uh, mentioned the other, the other day that uh, for the next uh, few years, 10 years, 20 years, uh, such competition, such great power relation will continue in the region and then we have to be uh, very cautious in order to cope with the situation. Uh, as George mentioned, uh, mentioned, a small country, we need to ad adapt, we need to adjust uh, to the situation as it is fo folding. The next question is from Wai Wu Lam. Other than offering tables and chairs, what else can Singapore do to promote dialogue between Taiwan and China? Yes, Singapore leaders are very careful not to be too clever by offering advice to other people. So we can state our views, we can offer our goodwill, we should be peacemakers, never troublemakers. Uh, so if Ch Taiwanese, Taiwanese and mainland leaders want to meet in Singapore, of course we are very honoured, we'll do everything to make it comfortable. When Trump and Kim Jong-un met in Singapore, I don't think they consulted Singapore beforehand. <laughs> but of course we welcome them. I was the first foreign minister to visit uh, Pyongyang, and we have very good relations with North Korea. And why not? Why not? So, that's our position. Goodwill, because goodwill for others leads to peace, is good for Singapore. If the world is in turmoil, it's very bad for Singapore. If there's conflict between mainland and Taiwan, it's very bad for Singapore. When Pelosi visited Taiwan, even I, I know of no Singaporean who was happy with that visit. Even my friends who were anti-PRC were all very angry. And in Hong Kong, they stayed up late at night to follow what was happening because it was not clear whether or not Pelosi was going to land in Taipei. You know, our wish is for there to be peace. And if there's peace, we'll find many ways to work together to benefit ordinary people. In the end, in politics, what is our objective? It is to benefit the Lao, Lao Pai Sing. And if people have better lives, have more hope for their children, that must be a good thing. Creating tension, ideologies, big ideas, I'm very suspicious of them. Because very often, they only lead to evil. This one is from Xu Hongquan. Do you think President Xi Jinping's stance is the same now as in 2015? And happy birthday, Mr. Yo. His position has changed. And how do you think about this? Uh, no. 
I, I want to mention this at the end of this session, but since uh, this gentleman already mentioned, may I invite all the audience, we give a round of applause for George for his birthday. Now, in any event, there's always some surprise that we already planned a certain highlight, but uh, just unfortunately it got, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we still have like a t one minute or two minutes, so we can still see your question. Another question from Xu Hetian. Will the new generation of Singaporean leaders be as passionate and politically dedica delicate as your generation in facilitating the cross-strait dialogues? We must never take for granted that an old position can be maintained without effort. It's very important for young Singapore leaders, younger Singapore leaders and younger Taiwan leaders to continue to meet, to continue to develop deep friendships, to continue to rely upon each other, to continue to feel that if they need help, they can ask the other side for help. And, and uh, I never expected that Taiwan, I, I'll need Taiwan to save my son. And in 2011, the first time we called on... Uh, you see, I could not visit Taiwan for seven years as foreign minister. The night I lost the elections, I told myself, I'm coming to Taiwan. Because this thing has weighed upon me that we, we have not expressed gratitude to Zheng Yan, Xiang Ren, and the donor, Huang Qichuan Xinsheng. So we came here. And then I called on President Ma, I called on uh, Vice President Lin Chan, uh, Vice President Vincent Xiu and others. And I proudly say, my son is Taiwanese by blood. He is, because his blood is not mine. His blood is, is that of a Taiwanese. So I never doubted that I could get this assistance from Taiwan. And Taiwanese should feel the same about Singapore. And that is the depth of a relationship. And it should continue into the future. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> OK, our time is up for this session. And uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, Judge and uh, our, uh, Mr. Lin and Professor Xu for participating in this uh, panel discussion. Uh, I was the moderator, but did not get any chance to say anything. So, so I would like to take the advantage uh, of, uh, to, to say a few words. Uh, even though I raised a bunch of questions uh, for, for, for George and the other panelists, in fact, I have, I have to say that uh, I agree to a large extent of what uh, George mentioned, especially I think uh, the cross relation, of course, is crucial for us. It's not crucial for George. But George spoke as a relative, uh, suggested what we, we need to move forward because we need to find a, a better future for Taiwan. They, he didn't want to see Taiwan involuntarily pushed into a war. So my personal opinion is that, and also a reason why we, we started this forum, this will not be the only forum, but we're going to have more in, in, in the coming days. But uh, I do hope that more and more people are willing to consider in a different way, rather than get stuck in the, the conventional views on the cross-strait relations. Like uh, George mentioned that a leader needs the courage uh, to look forward with vision and with the courage to take actions. I think this is important. This is also what I expect our current Zhongtong Hoxian they will have such a courage to, to speak out their attitude clearly, loud and clear about his attitude towards the cross strait relation and what kind of action he will take if he could be elected. And I hope this uh, forum has brought you some idea and uh, give you some uh, chance to think about the cross-strait relation in the future. Let me once again thank George and the panelists and all the distinguished guests for coming to this 
uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating in today's forum, and if you have time, please...